Welcome to this week's seminar. Um, before I introduce this week's speaker, I just want to review our seminar etiquette. So all audience members are muted throughout the seminar. Um, please do not try to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. There will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions live at the end of the talk, just like in a normal seminar. So once the speaker has finished their talk, you can use Zoom's raise hand feature to notify the meeting host that you'd like to ask a question. The raise hand feature is located under the reactions tab on the bottom of the Zoom window. At the end of the talk, you're invited to turn on your video during the questions portion. Um, so it is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Leslie Thorne. Dr. Thorne is an assistant professor at Stony Brook University. She obtained her PhD at Duke University where she studied seabird foraging and dynamic oceanographic features. Her research continues to focus on understanding the links between environmental variability, foraging behavior, and determining biophysical interactions driving the habitat use and foraging ecology of marine predators. Her work has provided her an opportunity to learn in a, um, to work in a variety of marine systems, including the Bay of Fundy, the South Atlantic Bight, the Sargasso Sea, the Antarctic Peninsula, and the Hawaiian Islands. So I'm looking forward to her talk today and learning more about the role of wind variability in albatross foraging energetics. Well, thanks very much for that introduction and for the invitation to come speak with you today. Um, I'm gonna to talk about some ongoing work in my lab um, looking at albatross foraging energetics and how that's impacted by variability in wind. Um, but first of all, to just sort of um, start out with, I want to take a step back and think about climate change and what we know about climate impacts on different marine organisms, and particularly marine megafauna like marine mammals and seabirds and sea turtles. So we know that climate change is having widespread impacts on factors such as fret prey availability, foraging habitat, trophic interactions, and phenology. Um, and that there are distributional shifts in a lot of organisms due to oceanographic change. Um, so for example, this is um, a figure here from a recent study um, of loggerhead sea turtles looking at projected shifts in their distribution um, under climate change going forward um, to 60 to 80 years on the right uh, most part of this figure um, in the different seasons shown um, along the different rows. Um, so this figure is showing that um, in association with increased um, sea surface temperatures in the Northeast, loggerhead sea turtle habitat will um, increasingly move sort of northward within that study area. Um, so there's been a lot of, um, I think, important focus on distributional shifts, um, but I think there are other important impacts that um, haven't really been examined um, in, in detail, in very much detail yet. And these include um, energetic consequences of um, changes to fluid flow and of the accessibility of different habitats. Um, so wind patterns and ocean currents have strong impacts on the movement and distribution of animals that fly or swim. So just to walk through a couple of examples here, this top figure is showing um, a week in the life of a short fin pilot whale um, tagged off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, so just down here. Um, and you can see that this animal's movements um, are closely following this meander in the Gulf Stream here. Um, so we think with these animals that go on this little sort of walkabout in the Gulf Stream that they're following the Gulf Stream flow on their way out and then kind of popping out of the Gulf Stream and making their way back to the coast um, outside of that strong flow. Um, down here on the bottom, this is showing um, a image from um, a different study looking at leather sea turtle, leatherback sea turtle movement um, in blue here um, relative to sea surface temperature and ocean currents. Um, and in black, that's showing the movement of a, um, a drifting buoy. Um, and so you can see that the, the turtle obviously moved, um, you know, like that, that drifting buoy um, along with the current, highlighting the importance of that, that current to its, its um, movement patterns. Um, so large marine vertebrates like tuna and sharks and, and cetaceans and seabirds are likely to be particularly sensitive to changes in fluid flow because they experience high drag while swimming or flying through marine habitats due to their large body sizes and their rapid travel speeds. Um, we know that the intensity and location of dominant wind patterns and ocean currents is being impacted by climate change. Um, and these changes will have direct impacts on the movement and energetics of flying and, and swimming animals. So I think this is really interesting since it's different than changes in habitat 
which might have you know, an indirect effect um, on animals through changes in prey distribution, for example. Um, these are you know, direct, um, these changes will have direct physical impacts on um, uh, animals and they're uh, a variable that we can predict directly from climate models. As well, um, variability in wind and ocean currents may be especially influential on um, populations of marine vertebrates like seabirds and pinnipeds that function as central place foragers while breeding, um, returning to the breeding colony to um, uh, feed their young or, or um, incubate eggs in the case of, of seabirds. So energy acquisition and allocation of these animals um, will have direct consequences for fitness and, and reproductive performance. Um, so I think in, in light of this ongoing change we're seeing in these um, physical variables, it's really important to understand uh, the effects of these changes um, in order to uh, understand and interpret movement patterns and distribution of these species. In the case of seabirds, wind speed and direction um, are major drivers of the movement and distribution of seabirds. So this is a, a figure from um, uh, one of Scott's papers um, uh, quite a while ago now that tracked um, sooty shear waters and found this sort of figure eight migration pattern that you see here. Um, and, and you can associate these movements um, with uh, the wind field. So at the start of the migration, the shear waters um, traveled eastward um, in the direction of prevailing westerly winds. Um, and then they used um, easterly trade winds to travel northwest across the Pacific um, to their foraging um, grounds. And then on their way back, they traveled um, in a southwesterly westerly direction, uh, again, using those easterly trade winds. Um, but we know that many seabirds take advantage of wind forces in order to decrease their energetic cost of transportation and um, to facilitate long distance movements. Uh, and of course, albatrosses have a particularly special relationship with, with wind. Um, so albatrosses, as you're surely aware, um, are large tube-nosed seabirds with enormous wingspan, so up to about 11 uh, or 11 and a half feet in the case of wandering albatrosses. So you can see the wingspan of um, a wandering albatross up here relative to the arm span of Shaquille O'Neal down here, uh, just to give you a, an indicator of size. Um, but in addition to factors that all flying birds show, um, adaptations to flight like uh, strutted bones, hollow strutted bones and the absence of teeth um, and increased bone fusion to, to provide structural rigidity, albatrosses have some unique adaptations um, such as a tendon between their elbow and shoulder joints um, that al allows them to sort of lock their wings in place um, while they're gliding. Um, and they have long narrow wings in order to facilitate gliding flight, um, as well as some behavioral adaptations which we're going to um, talk about in just a moment. But albatrosses are, are highly mobile. So this um, figure here is showing a satellite track of a female gray-headed albatross that circumnavigated Antarctica twice in one year. So albatrosses can reach speeds of more than 100 kilometers per hour uh, and travel up to 1,000 kilometers per day. Um, and of course, the wing morphology of albatrosses is really key to their flight behavior. Um, so there are a couple of um, important factors, such as aspect ratio, which is uh, the ratio of a wing span to its mean cord, um, and is often thought of as sort of a basic measure of aerodynamic efficiency. Uh, and the very long, thin wings of albatrosses result in this high aspect ratio, this uh, wing design that has been uh, mimicked by aircraft engineers. Um, I took this off of the internet. It was made by um, Phil Richardson at Huey. Um, this is obviously a conceptual illustration of a, a black rat albatross um, relative to an um, unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, but the idea here, obviously, that albatrosses and um, gliders can sort of take advantage of the same physics um, in order to fly fast and efficiently um, over the ocean. But wing loading is another important aspect of wing morphology. Um, this is the ratio of body mass to wing surface area. And you can think of this as a metric of um, the cost of flight. So um, you can have very uh, low values of wing loading as in the case of, of frigate bird, which can use um, uh, hovering um, flight. Uh, whereas in the case of razor bills um, shown in the middle here, they obviously have much smaller wings relative to um, their body size. 
uh, and have therefore higher wing loading um, and have much more um, expensive flight. And in fact, if, if wing loading gets too high, um, birds like penguins with really high wing loading have lost their ability to fly um, altogether. But if we look at these uh, variables, so aspect ratio on the y-axis here and wing loading on the x-axis here across a range of different bird species, um, you can see that albatrosses have uh, among the highest values of aspect ratio because of those long skinny wings um, and sort of intermediate values of wing loading. Um, so that, that sort of intermediate wing loading is offset by that high aspect ratio. So in other words, they have to move fast to stay aloft, but they can glide for long distances under most conditions. Um, and albatrosses use a technique called dynamic soaring. Um, that allows them to cover vast distances at high speeds without flapping their wings or rarely flapping their wings. So dynamic soaring um, takes advantage of the vertical wind gradient across um, low altitudes above uh, the sea surface to allow for flight, again, with very little mechanical energy cost. So when using this flight strategy, albatrosses are exploiting uh, wind shear or the change of wind speed and direction with altitude using um, an S-shaped flight trajectory. So um, this is sort of what a typical dynamic soaring cycle looks like. Um, so at the number one here, you've got the, the albatross actually turning into the wind in order to, to generate lift. Um, and at the top, uh, at two here, when they, when they start to, to slow down, they actually curve and turn um, so that they're going with the wind rather than into the wind. Um, as in uh, number three here during that leeward descent where they're, they're, they're picking up speed but losing altitude. Uh, and at four here at the bottom part of that um, cycle, they turn again and turn back into the wind and sort of repeat this cycle um, endlessly um, almost. So again, a, a way of flying really efficiently without having to, to do much work. Um, and we know that um, the distribution of albatrosses is closely related to, to wind. So this is a figure from a paper by Rob Surian. Um, and the black dots here are showing the location of different albatross colonies um, around the globe. So you can see that most albatross species are occurring uh, in this band of high wind speeds in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and most albatrosses in general are, are occurring in these windiest regions of the globe. Um, but not all of them. So you can see that there are um, species here in the North Pacific, short-tailed, black-footed, and lazan albatrosses, uh, where their breeding colonies are actually located in, in fairly in regions with fairly low wind speeds, um, which I'm going to come back to near the end of the talk. Uh, and in fact, waved albatrosses are kind of an anomaly in that they're occurring in a region with some of the lowest uh, wind speeds um, around the globe. Um, so there have been a handful of studies, um, or, or two or three studies, that have actually measured um, heart rate in albatrosses to try to get an idea of the energetic cost of albatross flight. So this is a figure from um, a paper by Sakamoto et al. Um, showing heart rate distributions across different um, general behaviors. So uh, this is during takeoff when the bird is taking off um, from the water or from um, the nest site. Uh, this is showing cruising flight here in B, C is showing um, landings, and D is showing heart rate when the birds are sitting on the water. Um, so you can see, first of all, that heart rate during cruising flight is really quite low. It's, it's actually similar to that uh, when the birds are sitting on the water. Um, and in contrast, flapping flight is energetically expensive. So that's represented during takeoff when the bird, birds have to um, flap their wings frequently in order to get off of the water. So as a result, we see that albatrosses are generally reducing the time that they spend uh, flapping. Um, this is from um, the first study uh, that put um, heart rate loggers on birds back um, about 20 years ago now, a little more than 20 years ago now, um, which looked at um, heart rate relative to wind in a very, in a very broad way. Um, so what they found, this is the, this top part of the figure here is showing the percentage of flight tracks that occurred in tailwinds, sidewinds, and headwinds. Um, and you can see that um, this suggests that these birds were primarily flying in tailwinds. Um, and on the bottom here, that heart rate um, increased uh, going from tailwinds to headwinds. 
Um, so uh, this is a little different than some of the results I'm going to be showing you here. Um, so I think it's important to note that um, this work was done, um, uh, again, sort of at a broad scale using tags that had a lower spatial resolution and also wind data with a lower resolution, but provides an interesting comparison with what we're seeing um, in, in different species today. Um, we also know that wind um, is, uh, can have important impacts on albatross life history. So this is from um, a science paper um, by Ari Wiemerskirch and colleagues um, that uh, found that, well, we knew that westerly winds in the Southern Ocean were increasing and moving forward. Um, as you can see down here um, at the, the breeding um, site for uh, the study site for this um, work. And in association with that, they found that albatross flight speeds increased over that same time period. And as a consequence, the duration of foraging trips decreased um, and both the breeding success shown here increased as well as the mass of individual birds, which we can use as sort of a rough indicator of body condition, uh, increased through time as well. Um, so this is suggesting that wind, um, you know, not only has sort of direct short-term impacts, but again, can, can influence population level um, processes in albatrosses. So I think there are um, some gaps in knowledge in terms of um, what we currently know about how albatrosses uh, use the wind. Um, so some of the work that we're doing right now is to better understand how variability in wind influences albatross energetics, um, taking, advantages, uh, taking advantage of some um, recent developments in, in tag technology, and then to look at the implications for different albatross species of those relationships, um, uh, both for different albatross species and for different colonies under climate change. So our specific objectives here were, first of all, um, to identify and categorize albatross flight behavior using accelerometers, and then to look at links between wind variability and albatross energetics and flight behavior. And then lastly, to look at the impacts of climate-driven changes uh, to wind patterns on albatross energetics. But I wanted to start by giving um, a big shout out to members of my lab whose uh, hard work I'm presenting today, particularly Melinda Connors on the left here, who has really done the bulk of uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about here today, um, as well as Zipporah Feldman on the right, a PhD student uh, in my lab who started to look at albatross movements um, and uh, characterizing wind envelopes um, needed for dynamic soaring in different albatross species. So the study species um, and study sites that I'm going to be talking about here today. So we have uh, two different study sites, um, but the bulk of the work I'm going to focus on today was done at the British Antarctic Survey's research station at Bird Island on South Georgia, um, shown here. And um, we're tagging at this location gray-headed albatrosses and black-browed albatrosses, which are sort of mid-sized albatrosses. Um, and we've just started doing some work with wandering albatrosses as well, which of course are the, are the giants of the seabird world. So again, most of what I'm gonna talk about here today focuses on these two species, uh, but I have a couple of sort of species comparisons across all five species, uh, including these two, um, Lazan albatrosses and black-footed albatrosses, which were tagged at an entirely different study site um, at Midway Atoll here in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, so these are, uh, Lazans are smaller albatross species and Blackfoots are sort of comparable to, uh, more comparable to, to grayheads and, and black brows. So getting to our first objective um, to try to identify and categorize albatross flight behavior. Um, so we used accelerometers, which measure acceleration in three dimensions and um, provide a really detailed high resolution um, data on flight behaviors and flight kinematics. Um, and of course, accelerometers today are present in many, many different devices uh, in you know, Fitbits, um, activity recorders, and your iPhone. Uh, I was even reading that laptops typically have accelerometers today so they can uh, turn themselves off if you drop them and they detect that acceleration. Um, but with the proliferation of, of uh, accelerometers, um, they've become a lot uh, smaller and, and lower in cost. Um, and have become um, quite widespread in studies of animal movement over the past uh, 10 years or so. So accelerometers are typically used to identify specific um, behaviors 
or events. So for example, in birds, they can be used to detect wing beats um, or to estimate energetic expenditure, which I will get to in just a moment. Uh, but just to kind of give you a picture of um, uh, the kind of signal you might get from an accelerometer, um, these are showing the three different um, axes here, three different um, axes of acceleration. So if you've got a human runner wearing a Fitbit here, uh, this is um, again a figure from a paper here. Um, so this is the, the change in that person's velocity through time. So you can see that that becomes consistent at a certain point. Um, but if you look at the heaving acceleration in light gray here, um, you'll see that that sort of up down acceleration continues while that person is running. Um, in contrast, the surging acceleration, you know, in this, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen here, the surging acceleration uh, in, in um, this direction um, really only is occurring um, as that velocity is increasing and then sort of tapers off. So in terms of looking at a, a sort of signal of, of running behavior from a Fitbit, um, you know, it's that sort of characteristic um, change in the, in the heaving acceleration that you'd be picking up on there. Um, so to look at um, behavior in albatrosses, we used a number of different types of tags together. So we deployed GPS tags, um, so we knew where the birds were. And then we deployed um, tags that had, in some cases, just accelerometers, and in other cases, both accelerometers and magnetometers, which allow you to also get the, the heading of um, the bird. So we've amassed a pretty good um, sample size at this point in time. So our work from Bird Island has been done over three field sites, over three breeding um, uh, seasons. I should note that um, as is the case for uh, pretty much all high resolution seabird work, it, we're restricted to the breeding season when we can put a tag out uh, and recover it from the same bird when the bird is coming back to incubate their egg or, or feed their chick. So we're actually um, taping these tags on um, with a special kind of tape. And again, uh, just taking them off when we, when we get those tags back. So um, you can see we've got um, our deployment sort of divided between some of these tags that include magnetometers that allow us to look at heading um, and, and tags with just the accelerometers. And I'm gonna talk about these tags in just a moment that allow us to look at heart rate. Um, so again, most of what I'm going to focus on is gray heads and black brows, uh, and we have a little bit of data, accelerometer data, uh, on lazians um, and blackfoots as well, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, so again, uh, looking at identifying and categorizing behavior, um, Melinda had a paper come out earlier this year using hidden Markov models to classify albatross behavior as soaring versus flapping versus sitting. So you can see the accelerometer signal here. Uh, again, in that heave axis, you can see a pretty clear signal um, when the bird is in flapping flight here. Um, individual flaps can be detected using that heaving acceleration uh, in contrast to soaring or when the bird is on the water. Um, so I think this kind of approach where we're um, you know, using models to categorize behavior is really important. And it's something that hasn't been done um, in a lot of the literature um, looking at accelerometer de um, uh, to, to identify behavior. You can, you can eyeball these behaviors, but I think especially when you've got very large data sets like we're starting to get here, we've got weeks and weeks of data. Uh, it would take a lot of someone's time to go through, you know, piece by piece and try to try to eyeball different behavioral states. So I think this kind of approach is, is really important and is going to be uh, really helpful to um, the next stages of our work. We've also started to see some really interesting patterns and in sort of soaring gates in birds that are dynamic soaring. So this is showing the arcing rate. So the number of cycles, those um, dynamic soaring cycles per unit time. Uh, relative to the arc size illustrated here. Um, although I should note this is as though you're sort of looking down on the bird as opposed to like the vertical amplitude of, um, of uh, an arc. But you can see there's this sort of characterized um, uh, uh, characteristic gait um, where the birds are um, arcing faster uh, and showing um, bigger um, arc sizes as well. Um, and what was really interesting is that this is quite consistent between species. So both in gray-headed albatrosses and black-browed albatrosses, we saw that similar um, relationship between those sort of soaring gates. 
looking at the amount of time that birds spend in different behavioral classes. So this is showing the proportion of time spent flapping over here on the left, soaring in the middle, uh, and on the water over here on the right. Um, so I, I should have mentioned that we um, applied this um, behavioral classification on four different species that we had data for at that time. So black brad, black footed, um, gray headed, and Lazan albatrosses. Um, and you can see that in all of these species, they spent the majority of um, their time on these foraging trips soaring. Um, although there is quite a bit of variability between species and also between individuals in terms of how much time they're spending in each category. Um, and so we're looking into you know, whether that variability is explained by wing, wind or variability in, in wing morphology, for example. So moving on to our second objective, we wanted to look at links between wind variability and albatross energetics and, and flight behavior. Uh, and of course, we have the obvious challenge of trying to estimate energetic expenditure during a foraging trip where a bird can be located you know, hundreds or thousands of kilometers from a nest. So ideally, uh, you know, if you were studying energy expenditure in a human, uh, you'd, you'd have a setup like this, where um, you, you're directly measuring oxygen consumption um, across different movements or different behaviors. But obviously, that's never going to happen with a flying albatross. Um, so how can we go about trying to estimate energetic expenditure um, for birds in, in the wild? Um, there have been a few different approaches used in the past. Uh, including the doubly labeled water method, which reflects total energy expenditure integrated over a time period. So for albatrosses over the course of a foraging trip. Um, uh, but that doesn't allow you to have these sort of real time estimates of energy expended during um, the course of a foraging trip. So it doesn't allow you to look at variability during a foraging trip. The heart rate method can provide a metric of energetic expenditure during foraging trips. But there are downsides in that fitting loggers can be difficult or costly uh, and also can be quite invasive. So this isn't something you'd usually do on a big scale. Um, but, but increasingly, um, different researchers are using something called ODBA or overall dynamic body acceleration, which provides a proxy of energetic expenditure at a fine temporal scaling scale using accelerometers. So we wanted to investigate using ODBA to estimate energy expenditure in albatrosses. Um, so this, this ODBA approach um, relies on the um, sort of uh, fact that movement is the most variable factor modulating energetic expenditure. So body acceleration should correlate with energetic expenditure. So ODBA is the sum of dynamic acceleration from um, the three different axes. So you determine um, dynamic acceleration by subtracting the static component from the total acceleration. And then ODBA is basically the sum of the absolute values of dynamic acceleration from those three axes. Um, but this is very convenient in terms of studying um, energetics in that it provides one single integrated measure of body motion in three dimensions. So it's a very convenient metric of, of movement and therefore a proxy for energetic expenditure. Um, and of course, with the, the widespread use of accelerometers today, it's comparatively easy to, uh, to estimate. We know from previous studies that um, ODBA can provide a good proxy for energetic expenditure in a range of different mammal and bird species. Uh, so this figure here is from um, a recent paper uh, that um, put an animal on a treadmill and again directly um, looked at oxygen consumption um, and found a good fit between oxygen consumption and um, ODBA. However, there have been some studies um, indicating the limits of this approach. So for example, while ODBA has found to work well, um, it to correlate well in, in flying segments of bird movement, there's very poor performance during diving. This has been found in a, in a few different studies. So given that this is a, a relatively new method, um, I think it's really important to you know, be very careful when applying it to new movement modes um, or new applications. It becomes really important to validate. So we set about validating ODBA um, in albatross flight um, using heart rate, heart rate to provide a means of sort of ground truthing um, ODBA. So we used tags that um, included magnetometers and accelerometers and GPS and also ECG data so that we could look at heart rate. 
Um, and we also wanted to, to estimate VO2. So we looked at two different methods for doing this. Uh, the first using an equation derived from an, an older study where they um, recorded both heart rate and VO2 having um, a black browed albatross walk on a treadmill. Um, and a second method um, using a model applied across different bird species that estimated VO2 um, for a given mass and, and heart rate. Uh, and we actually found that both methods um, produced quite similar estimates of VO2 over the range of heart rates that we were seeing for albatrosses. Uh, and we ended up using um, this first approach in order to estimate um, oxygen consumption or, or VO2. So in this case, um, in addition to our GPS accelerometer and magnetometer, we had a subset of tags that also had these ECG recorders. Um, so a total of um, 14 black browed albatrosses and 10 gray heads that got these ECG recorders. Okay, so what did we find? Um, does ODBA reflect energetic expenditure in albatrosses? Um, well, as you can see here, so this is showing um, VO2 or, or oxygen um, consumption here, um, derived from heart rate, relative to mean ODBA. And what you can see is that when the bird is not spending a lot of time soaring um, up here, that, that there is quite a strong relationship between VO2 and ODBA. However, when birds are soaring, um, spending a lot of time soaring, there really isn't much of a relationship at all. And that's unfortunate because of course, albatrosses are spending a lot of their time soaring. Um, and we think that what's going on here is that during dynamic soaring, the energetic cost is incurred really because of sort of postural hold. So holding their wings out straight against the forces of, of wind as opposed to being represented well by dynamic um, acceleration. So um, we think that ODBA is, is overestimating energetic expenditure, um, again, because that dynamic acceleration is high, but again, isn't really representing energy expended. Um, and again, this is concerning because um, soaring makes up such a, a high proportion of the time that these birds are foraging. Um, so um, we also looked at uh, VO2, so estimated um, or, or derived oxygen consumption across different behavioral states. Um, I should mention that when we're categorizing behavior, we're doing that over 30 second periods. Um, but then when we're looking at the data here, we actually looked at it over an hour so we could relate it to our hourly wind data. So that's why we've got these mixed behaviors here. Um, so the behaviors here that we've identified as soaring or flapping, that's when more than 95% of that hour was spent either soaring or flapping. So you can see as expected um, and as observed in previous studies that um, flapping incurred uh, the highest energetic cost, highest oxygen consumption here. Um, and so this suggested that perhaps we could use the number of flaps from the accelerometer data to provide a measure of how much energy albatrosses are, are using while on a foraging trip. Uh, and so actually we found that the number of flaps did provide a pretty good predictor of VO2. Um, so this is a model, a behavior model um, that looks at the number of flaps uh, and then also incorporates the number of landings because whenever the bird lands on the water, it incurs a lot of um, energy having to, um, having to get back up into the air again. Um, so the number of flaps did um, quite a good job at predicting VO2 um, and therefore would be a good metric of um, energy expenditure. So you can see here um, the fit here between the heart rate derived VO2 on the y-axis um, relative to the, the predicted VO2 from this model. So at the hourly level, there was a pretty good um, fit when we're able to account for, for um, individual variability. Um, and up here, when you summarize that over a longer time scale, so at a daily time scale, um, the fit improves, which is consistent with what has been observed in previous studies when you sort of scale up that that model fit gets even better. So um, again, then we wanted to link this to wind. So we used um, data from um, climate reanalysis models. Um, so you can see this is um, wind speed, so blue being low wind, red being high wind here, um, relative to our, our two study sites, so Midway up here and Bird Island, where the black browed and gray albatrosses were tagged down here. So you can see Bird Island is um, you know, exposed again to, to much faster winds um, a lot of the time. 
But this product provides hourly wind data at a resolution of about 30 kilometers, which is, uh, which is a, a good um, resolution for looking at how wind influences our, our albatrosses. Um, so, and of course the GPS tags give us the information on where the bird is in space. So latitude, longitude at different times. So we can use that positional information to um, get the wind date, data at the appropriate location. So uh, when we look at how um, behavior relates to wind, this is showing for black rat albatrosses on the left, gray-headed albatrosses on the right, the proportion of time in flapping flight relative to wind speed. So you can see that the time spent flapping um, decreases rapidly at faster wind speeds. So in other words, they're spending a lot more time soaring down here. So um, in winds less than about 20, 25 kilometers per hour, albatrosses are flapping about 50 or 60% of the time. However, in winds greater than about 50 kilometers per hour down here, um, these birds are, are really not spending much time at all flapping. So in other words, uh, not spending um, a huge amount of energy. Uh, and it was interesting to see uh, you know, similar relationships between these two species, but also when we looked at wind direction, so whether birds were flying in headwinds or sidewinds or tailwinds, that this really didn't change that relationship all that much, which was, uh, which was quite surprising actually. Um, when we looked at how much time birds are spending in crosswinds uh, versus tailwinds or sidewinds, um, we actually found there that they're spending most of their time here in crosswinds, which again was surprising uh, based on findings in previous studies. Um, and then after that in, in tailwinds and um, the least amount of time in, in headwinds. Um, so again, different than some of some uh, earlier studies of albatrosses. When we looked at um, relationships um, between energy expenditure and, and flight speed and the direction of wind, um, we found that VO2, you know, representing energetic expenditure, did not differ between headwinds and crosswinds and tailwinds. Um, but I should mention, sorry, this is during soaring, but the flight speed was different between those head, cross, and tailwinds. So while it didn't cost birds more energy to, to fly in headwinds, there was sort of an indirect cost in that they weren't able to move as fast. Um, so this suggests that there's an advantage of flying in, in tail or crosswinds in order, um, in terms of being able to travel further and or to get back to the nest site more quickly uh, in order to trade off with their mate incubating the egg or in order to be able to feed their, their chick frequently enough um, without um, incurring that extra cost um, uh, reflected by you know, similar cost across these different um, wind directions. Uh, we also see generally um, looking at these different soaring gates um, in albatross species that um, generally we see um, higher arc rates and sort of steeper arcs in stronger winds um, and lower arc rates in lighter winds as well. But in terms of how um, VO2 or energy expenditure was influenced by wind during soaring, um, we really didn't see much of an impact there at all. Um, so this is showing um, VO2 relative to wind speed. This is only for soaring birds during um, head, cross, and tailwinds. Um, you can see this is showing the distribution of VO2 during soaring in the two species of albatross. So you can see that there is quite a bit of variability in, in VO2 while soaring, um, but we're just not, not accounting for that variability using, using wind speed. So um, our current question is, is what is causing that variability in, in um, VO2 during soaring? Um, and so this is, this is sort of an open question that we're continuing to, uh, to look into. Um, we can also make comparisons of the relationship between uh, wind and flight um, between different albatross species. So if we go back to our five study species, um, if we look at their body size, um, we can create a, a single body size index by um, doing an ordination on a number of different morphometric um, measurements. Uh, so in general, this body size goes from, from smaller to larger here with Lausanne albatrosses being the smallest. Um, up to wanderers, of course, being much larger than any of our other study species. But we talked about wing loading at the beginning of um, 
this talk. And wing loading, of course, is another important factor. Um, when we look at how wing loading varies across these species, um, we see that black-footed albatrosses have um, higher wing loading um, than a couple of these other species. So while, while they're a little bit smaller than black brows, um, they actually have a slightly higher wing loading. Um, so we wanted to look at how these different factors related to their soaring behavior. Um, this plot is from a, a figure by Rob Surian showing uh, that wing loading relative to um, a body size index. Um, and you can see they didn't study gray-headed, so I stuck gray-headed uh, in the approximate location here. Um, but you can see that these birds that we've studied are all fairly close together in terms of both wing loading and body size. It's going to be really interesting. Um, we don't, I should say, we don't yet have um, our data process for the wandering albatrosses, so we don't have um, detailed information on their soaring behavior yet. Uh, we're just looking at these four species um, for now. It's going to be really interesting um, in this context to look at wanderers just because they're so different. Um, but basically, based on this information, we expected that body size and wing loading were going to be um, important factors in looking at what wind conditions um, birds could soar under. Um, so we expected that birds with higher wing loading or higher wing loading relative to their body size, so a bigger residual here, um, would require more wind to soar. But that's not really what we're seeing. Um, so this is showing uh, the proportion of time soaring here for um, on the top here are two southern ocean species, black brown albatross and gray-headed albatross. Um, and you can see that for these two species, um, we see more soaring with higher wind speeds, which is what would, we would expect. However, when you look at the two species tagged at Midway Atoll, um, the Blackfoots and the Laysans, there isn't such a neat relationship. And in particular for Laysan albatrosses, we see these birds spending a lot of time soaring at extremely low wind speeds, which we really were not expecting. Um, so we're trying to figure out basically what is going on, what this is telling us for these two species in the North Pacific. And uh, one thing, because we're seeing such um, a difference between the study sites, is whether there might be some broader environmental factor uh, that could be influencing this pattern. So for example, might differences in air density be playing a role here? Um, of course, there's lower air density in, um, in warmer, uh, in, in the tropics as opposed to at the poles, uh, Midway being a much more tropical um, study site than, than the sub-Antarctic island of South Georgia. Um, and we only have data from Midway from birds that were brooding chicks, which means that they were uh, more spatially constrained than birds who are incubating eggs that can go for longer trips. Um, so that just means that they're having to stay closer to that breeding site and therefore sort of staying in those warmer waters than they might in other, other, um, uh, under other um, weeks or months. Um, so we're wondering how this might impact um, the wind conditions needed for dynamic soaring. Uh, we know that air density is a really important factor to consider when looking at bird flight. Um, really important impacts on flight performance. Um, and there have been a number of studies looking at this, but they've primarily focused on differences in altitude because, of course, uh, there's a de decrease in air density with altitude. Um, but this is from a study of Himalayan um, vultures, which looked at different metrics of um, flight performance um, relative to air density. So what they saw here, so on this bottom plot here, you can see that the air speed of the bird uh, increased with air density. Um, and these birds are, are using this, um, uh, taking advantage of thermals to circle up um, in, um, up in altitude. Um, and, and they also found that the birds changed their banking angle um, as they were circling up at higher altitudes. Um, and this was to prevent, to, to decrease their sinking rate um, because lift decreases as you're, you're um, increasing, um, sorry, decreasing density here. I'm saying that wrong on, on this axis here. Um, so you can see that uh, difference in behavior up here that their circle radius got bigger because they were having to change their banking angle in order to um, reduce their sinking rate. Um, so we're wondering whether there might be impacts on albatross flight um, between, between species 
uh, breeding at midway, which would have um, a different uh, air density than species at South Georgia. Um, I should note that the differences in density that are being shown here are quite a bit bigger than what we would see between our two study sites. Um, but it's possible, or, or we're wondering whether it might be possible that air density, um, that um, lower air density in, um, at Midway could be associated with an increase in flight speed. And perhaps that might mean that less wind is needed for dynamic soaring. Um, of course, it's complicated as lower the air density also decreases um, lift. Um, but I think we can look at some of these behavioral changes. So for example, we always see occasional flaps during dynamic soaring. Um, and is it perhaps possible that those occasional flaps are happening more often in Lazan and black-footed albatrosses breeding at midway, um, allowing them to continue their dynamic soaring? Um, so if there were impacts of air density, we'd expect to see changes during flapping flight as well. Um, so in lower density air, you'd have to have a higher flapping rate and or a greater amplitude of flaps. And these are all things that we can look at with the accelerometer data uh, in which we plan to do. Okay, just to um, quickly look at some ongoing work um, assessing the impacts of um, climate-driven changes to, to wind patterns on albatross energetics. Um, so we know that westerly winds are shifting forward under climate change and that this pattern is expected to accelerate in the future. So as those strong westerly winds move forward, um, what are the implications for breeding albatrosses? So um, we're looking at this in a couple of different ways. We recently started to define um, what wind conditions are needed in order for albatrosses to soar. So can we define those wind conditions as sort of wind envelopes needed for soaring? Uh, and then we want to look at how the spatial location of those wind envelopes um, might change under climate scenarios. Uh, and again, we do this by identifying where and when birds are soaring of our classification methods um, and looking at the wind conditions in those locations. Um, so we've started, so this, this plot is showing wind speed up here um, across this whole panel relative to a bird's track. Um, and this is for a black rat albatross. Um, and this part down here is where we're restricting um, the, the wind being shown um, to winds where soaring can occur at least 50% of the time. So we've started to see if we can try to visualize wind envelopes, um, conditions needed for soaring using an approach like this and what that might look like. Um, so again, you can see the track of the bird here relative to wind conditions um, during each day of its track. Um, and you can see that generally the bird is staying in regions of, of quite high wind speed. Um, and we plan to use this kind of approach to look at how habitat use um, across species um, uh, or across wind conditions um, varies depending on whether the bird is traveling or foraging um, and, uh, you know, use this approach to try to make inferences about what future changes will mean for albatrosses. Um, so more broadly in terms of understanding the impacts of climate change, um, we're using these wind energy relationships. So those relationships between heart rate and VO2 and these different uh, energetic metrics um, and how those vary based on wind conditions. Um, to apply those relationships to future wind conditions under climate scenarios. So we're working with colleagues um, here at SOMAS who are climate scientists to integrate these wind energy relationships with, with a future wind field uh, to get a sense of how that future wind field um, might impact albatrosses. Um, and in particular, we're interested in looking at how that might vary across different albatross colonies. So these are showing the main albatross colonies and stars here um, around the Southern Ocean. Um, and you can see that there's quite a bit of variability in terms of um, the latitude of these colonies. So for example, if you take a colony like, like Amsterdam Island here, um, this is occurring further north than many of the colon other colonies. Um, so currently that would be, you know, close to these strong westerly winds, but as those winds start to shift, shift poleward under climate change, this could mean that birds at that breeding colony would have to travel farther to reach the higher wind speeds needed for soaring. Um, so again, we want to look at those implications of those shifting winds for colonies occurring in different regions of the ocean. Um, so just to give you a few take-homes from what I've talked about here today, hopefully I've 
um, convinced you that wind patterns drive albatross movement and distribution, um, we were able to identify where albatrosses were soaring versus flapping when they were in flight using accelerometer data and looked at the wind conditions needed um, for soaring to occur. We found that ODBA, um, a commonly used proxy for energetic expenditure, didn't correlate well with um, VO2 in, in um, dynamic soaring albatrosses, but that flaps provided a pretty good metric of energetic expenditure. We also saw that VO2 was not impacted by wind direction, but flight speed um, was faster during tail and crosswinds than in headwinds. Um, and surprisingly, we found that Laysan and black-footed albatrosses were able to soar at, at quite low wind speeds. Um, and the links that we're finding here between energy and wind, um, we hope will allow us to understand the implications of climate-driven changes to wind um, on albatross movement, energetics, and life history. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the many collaborators and contributors to this work, and again, um, particularly Melinda Connors and Zipporah Feldman, um, as well as all of the other folks that would help have helped with the research and the field work, um, and our funders, um, NSF, uh, and the British Antarctic Survey, um, and others at, at SOMAS as well. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. It looks like you do have some questions all ready to go. So um, I think Annie got her hand up first. So we can go ahead and I did a great job. I really enjoyed the talk and I'll have <laughs> questions also. <laughs> hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Oh, thanks so much. Um, I was really captured by one of your earlier plots where you're describing that um, gate the albatross has where it kind of turns into the the face and then descends downward and I think I saw on the x-axis you had kind of the length of that turn and I wondered and maybe this is kind of what you were getting at with the arc rates per minute but does the the cycle of that pattern um, change depending on the winds or the density like is the I guess my question is is that increase in arc rate because the length scale is the same and they're just moving through it more quickly or are they making tighter arcs? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so it's it's um, both. So they're both arcing more, more quickly and also sort of more steeply. Um, and again, what was, what was really interesting to me is that it seems to be kind of a characteristic pattern um, relationship between those, those that they follow. And that was true of, of both species, which to me suggests that you know, some kind of physical force um, might be driving that relationship. So we do see some relationships with wind there where they're both arcing more um, often and having sort of steeper arcs when the winds are stronger. So yeah, yeah, great question. It's so cool. It, it reminds me of how a surfer is kind of like gaining, like using and storing energy, turning up and down a wave. So yeah, really exactly. Neat. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. That yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, all right. It looks like Tom has a question. Uh, thank you. Um, that was a very interesting talk, and that was a great segue, actually, um, because my question is about waves. And I remember reading, um, and I could be mistaken. It's a long time ago, but that albatrosses can also use waves to soar in addition to the the wind shear that you showed and so i was wondering if you thought that might be a factor in the midway albatrosses where they might see large waves under low wind conditions yeah so that's a that's another great question yeah so so that is true and in fact um there was a paper um i showed a figure from by by rob surian where they looked at the distribution of albatrosses i showed the figure where they looked at wind speed but they actually also looked at at wave height. Um, and I think that is an important factor. Um, often we see that those two things are quite close, closely correlated, right? So where you've got really strong winds, you've also got bigger waves. Um, so I, I think that could be a factor in, in what we're seeing at, at Midway, um, but I would be surprised um, you know, if, if it's not like there would be bigger waves than you'd expect to see in the Southern Ocean kind of thing. Um, but I mean, perhaps they're taking advantage more of those waves when they have to. 
Um, the other thing that I think will be really interesting to see with that, you know, midway South Georgia difference is that we only have data from, from brooding, again, when they're constrained. And so I wonder if that relationship will hold true when they're less constrained, you know, like, is there some way that they can soar? So, you know, it's being detected as soaring, um, but perhaps it's less efficient soaring than they're able to do when they're exposed to, to, um, to higher wind speeds. Um, but yeah, certainly waves are an important part of the, of the um, picture here too as well, yeah. So that sort of leads into my question. I, I thought the difference between, I, like, I think it's interesting that the Laison albatross can soar or they soar at low speeds. And I know, I don't know, but it might have something to do with the timing. Um, I know they've measured metabolic rate in Laison albatross in Hawaii, but I can't remember what time of year. Um, but do they have higher metabolic rates? Like, did you see any differences in that? Because I know it's at a coarser scale, it's doubly labeled water, but they did measure it over foraging trips. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. We actually haven't, because Scott and um, I think Michelle, Michelle. Pappas, yeah, um, we haven't actually done those comparisons yet. Um, so Lazans are quite a bit smaller, so you would expect to see, you know, higher metabolic rate, but, um, but that's something, um, there are a couple of studies that have um, looked at seabirds and compared ODBA to um, doubly labeled water, and that would be really cool to do. Um, we don't have any, in the short term, we don't have any plans to do that field work, but just to compare the metabolic rates as you're suggesting would be really interesting. So we don't have any heart rate data yet for, yeah. um, for Lazans. I'm hoping, um, you know, we're not officially doing, doing field work there, but we're sort of piggybacking off of another project. And I'm hoping that maybe next breeding season, we might be able to take our heart rate loggers that are currently on South Georgia and deploy them there. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right, does anyone else have any more questions? Well, if there are not any more questions, I guess we'll go ahead and let you go, but thank you very much. That was, a, I, I love energetics and seabirds, so perfect talk for me. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for hosting me. It was nice to, uh, it was nice to meet you virtually. It would obviously be much more fun to do it in, in person. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully one day that will be possible again. Yeah. <laughs> No, but yeah, thank you very much. That was great. All right. Thank you. Take care.